be still and know you are God. That was a sentence I had to repeat many times last week. Uh, due to circumstances unpredicted and in many ways unpredictable by me and indeed by others, my visa got refused. And uh, now I have to leave the country. However, I'm very happy that I'm here today because according to the Home Office, I was meant to leave last Sabbath. But God was good and merciful and um, people still know compassion. So I was given until Tuesday next week to leave the country and then try to sort out my visa and, and be back in this place. Um, and I can tell you one thing. I'm tired of being a student. I was hoping to finish in July, and now I have to finish sometime next semester. I'm tired of being a student. How many of you are students or have ever been students? How many of you enjoyed it? You see, I, I used to enjoy being a student, but now I'm tired of it. I spend too much time studying. People my age should be done studying. And I studied many different things. My head is confused at this point. I studied psychology. I studied culture and global media. And I'm studying theology. I'm tired of studying. But I will tell you that during my studies, I met some people, some lecturers. I was in some classes that changed me, that inspired me and influenced me a lot. One such class was in, um, during the time when I was studying culture and media. There was this professor who was visiting. He was on loan for a few years. He came from the University of Columbia in, um, in New York, in America. And we, were, we felt privileged that we were in his class because, you know, he's a foreign professor from such an um, important, famous university. So we, the few of us that were in his class, because few of us were interested in, in what he was teaching. Uh, he was teaching philosophy, comparative literature, and religion. But at my university, he was, he was doing two courses, and those had to do with reading um, French post-structuralist philosophers, not something many people are interested in. So a few of us were in his class, and we felt privileged, but then we were shocked when the first time we sat in this classroom, he put us in a circle, and he gave us a handout, a text that we're going to read, and then he just sat there, and he was quiet. So we looked at each other, utterly confused as to what is going on, and then someone managed to conjure up the courage to ask the question, excuse me, sir, what are we meant to do? And they said, well, whatever you please. And then there was silence again. And then someone asked, well, maybe we should start. And he said, yes, please. But then someone else, someone else asked, but, but how do we start? He said, whichever way you like. And it took us a while until we realized what he wanted us to do. He wanted us to just be spontaneous and almost like in a ther group therapy session. Uh, and we ended up reading, I'll tell you this, we ended up reading one sentence for the whole semester. Three weeks we were just reading the title of the text. Because he wanted to show that nothing is obvious, that, that things need to be uh, searched for beneath the surface. That we needed to scratch and, and dig a bit deeper to find other possible meanings, not just the one that is uh, seemingly apparent at first reading, at first glance. So that changed me. And then, of course, I came to Newbold. And this trend of weird teaching techniques kind of continued. But I'm most grateful to God for this because it helped me apply the same mindset to the biblical text and, um, and challenged me to look beyond what seems to be obvious, and it's obvious because it's reinforced by the many times you've heard something from Sabbath school to um, your local church to your home worship sessions. It encouraged me to dig deeper than that and find possible other meanings in the text. So what I want us to do now is I want to share with you uh, my journey and my wrestling, if you will, with the text we just read. To understand this text, the text of Jacob at the Jabbok, we need to look at the history of Jacob. Uh, I'm sure that many of you, if not all of you, are familiar with this, but it's good to just 
recap. Jacob was born a twin. His twin was Esau, and at birth we are told that Jacob was wrestling with Esau in his mother's womb. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he grabbed him by the heel and tried to pull him inside so that he would come out as the firstborn. And he was therefore named Jacob, which literally means heel grabber, the one who grabs the heel. And this name ended up being a descriptor of his identity. He lived a life full of lies, full of tricks, full of schemes, full of evil plans. He, um, we know a very famous incident when he sold some soup to his brother in order to inherit the birthright and then used illegitimate means pretending that he is in fact his brother to try and trick his um, and try and succeed in tricking his old and, and blind father uh, with his mother's help to also inherit the blessing that was not meant for him. And Esau, when he learned this, he was angry. He was very upset, and Rebekah, his mother, advised Jacob that he should flee. He should leave, he should run away in order to escape his brother's wrath. And he continued living his life full of lies, full of tricks, full of schemes. Another a notable uh, episode in his, his, in his life is the relationship of lies and tricks going on between him and his uncle, Laban, which involved, among other things, giving Jacob the wrong daughter in marriage, breaking the contract that they made in terms of his employment, paying him the wrong wages, and then him running away with his wife and stealing his um, uncle's idols, etc. And then we come to a point in his life where God tells him that he should go back to his home country, to Canaan. And on his journey, he decides to listen to God, and on his journey, he is told that his brother Esau is coming to meet him, but he's not coming alone. In fact, he was told that Esau is bringing 400 men with him. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone told me that someone's coming to see me and bringing 400 people, I would be scared. And so was Jacob. He wasn't sure what to expect from this encounter, and he wasn't sure if these 400 men are bearing gifts or swords. So he decided to be proactive. So he sent forth messengers to meet his brother Esau. And these messengers, in fact, carried gifts. He tried to bribe his brother. He tried to somehow appease him. He tried to somehow ease the situation. And we still see that even at this point, he's still trying to, he's doing what he does best. He's trying to trick the situation, trick, the, 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 he trick his brother into tweaking the situation in his favor. This is something that he did his whole life, and he's good at this. So he comes to the river Jabbok, and then the text tells us that he sends his two wives, his two maids, his 11 children, and all his property, all his possessions. He sends everything to the other side of the river. And now he's on this side of the river, and he is alone. And this brings us to the very scene that I'm trying to reconstruct in our imaginations. So he is there. It's nighttime. He is alone, he is very much afraid, he knows that he is guilty, he is, he is, he is uh, burdened by his guilt, and he's dreading the encounter with his brother, he doesn't know what to expect, he's thinking about the 400 possibly angry men, he's no, he knows that his family is on the other side, unprotected, he knows that all his property is on the other side, unprotected, and then he hears a sound, something cracks, so he turns around, and there's no one. And he turns back and there's a man standing right in front of him. And the text simply says, and the man wrestled with him until daybreak. There's no introduction. There is no explanation. This fact is just dropped on us. The man wrestled with him until daybreak. But we know one thing though. Jacob was good at wrestling. He started his career before he was even born. He was good at wrestling. He was wrestling before he was born. And then to emphasize the importance of this um, truth, the text does a little play with words. You see, Jacob's name in Hebrew is Jacob. And Jacob was by the river Yabok. And he was wrestling, which in Hebrew is Yabek. So you have Jacob at the Yabok doing Yabek. In other way, in other way 
Uh, in other words, the, the, the writer of this text is trying to tell us that he is right where he belongs, doing what he does best. He is in his most natural self, behaving in a way most natural to him. He is his most authentic self. The text then says that when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. So who was this man, we may ask ourselves. And I will tell you that scholars do not agree on the identity of, of this man. Some would say that this was um, an angel. Some would say that this was the angel of the Lord, which in other words is the Lord. So this was then God. Some would say this was the spirit of Esau that came to haunt him. Some would say this was his imagination of the spirit of Esau that came to haunt him. Some would say this is his consciousness projected that he was, that he was wrestling with, his guilt. And I will suggest to you that rather than uh, getting lost in this, in this confusion, I would suggest a fusion of all these things because these things are not mutually exclusive. If he was wrestling an angel and if this angel was the angel of the Lord and, this was, and if this was the Lord, he was then wrestling with God. And it is not excluded that um, it is not forbidden that he was projecting onto this man his conscience, his guilt, and this, this um, idea that he had, this fear that he had of Esau and all the 400 men with him. It is not excluded. But I'd like to suggest that there is too much evidence in the text that um, forces us to accept that he was wrestling God. One of those is the fact that in some translations, the text says that the man touched him on his hip. I will tell you that no ordinary man can touch you on the hip and your hip goes out of joint. But he continues to wrestle. He was stubborn. He was persistent. And then the man said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So the fact that the man said, let me go for the day is breaking, should have been enough evidence for Jacob to understand who he is wrestling with. See, God said that no one can see him and live. And even though some may say, well, this was not God as such. This was God in a human incarnation. Nevertheless, he gave Jacob a clue as to who he is and what his identity is. He told him, let me go for the day is breaking, because if the day breaks and you see me, you will die. But Jacob didn't understand this. As a matter of fact, by his response, we can, we can, we can understand, we can conclude that he thought that he was wrestling an evil spirit. You see, there is an ancient Middle Eastern Mesopotamian um, superstition or myth. And in fact, I can trace this myth in many other cultures, including my own. And the myth basically um, says that if an evil spirit is met by the sunlight, the spirit will vanish. The evil spirits only dwell in the darkness. So when this man told Jacob that he should let him go for the day is breaking, Jacob thought that this evil spirit was afraid of the day breaking. And therefore he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So what is he doing right now? He is continuing doing what he does best, wrestling, bullying people to give him something that doesn't belong to him. He already bullied the blessing out of his father once, taken it by force using illegitimate means and lies and tricks. And now he's trying to do the same, trying to get the blessing by force. He says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And it is it's pathetic from this standpoint now, reading this text, to see how he, he, he allowed himself the audacity to even suggest something like this. He is there with a, with a hip out of his socket, wrestling with God Almighty, and he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. Which gives us an insight into his, his mindset. You see, he, is, he was, I uh, don't know what other word to use. He was a capitalist. He was trying to gain profit from every situation. You see, if we look at, if we look at um, slightly further back in the, in the, into the Bible, if we look at Genesis 28 and verse 20, we see how Jacob is offering God his vows. But within his vows, he has so many terms and conditions that apply. He says, this, this is Jacob's vow to God. 
This is his pledge of allegiance to God. If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give, you, give one tenth to you. What kind of silly terms and conditions are these? This is a capitalist who is trying to set prices, who is trying to set conditions. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit like many of you have uh, witnessed this recently. You know, now all of these um, tech companies are flooding you with, with um, emails telling you that the, their privacy policies have changed. And now you go to these websites and they're still doing their same, their old, same old things. They're still putting cookies into your computer. They're still monitoring your data, but now they want you to to uh, accept this, to agree with this. They want you to say that you have acknowledged what they're doing and, and allow it. It's the same kind of mentality that Jacob is manifesting here. He's threatening God that he won't let go. What? With his hip displaced. Seriously. So God saw right through this and he asked him, what is your name? And he replied saying, Jacob. So God saw how silly, how pathetic this situation was. So he decided to confront Jacob with his reality. He decided to give Jacob a little reality test. He asked him, what is your name? And Jacob said, I am Jacob. But by saying that, he said much more. He said, I am the heel grabber. I am the liar. I am the trickster. I am the schemer. I am the calculated, capitalist, self-centered, selfish Jacob. By saying his name, he didn't just identify himself. He confessed. He confessed his true identity. He confessed his past. Him saying his name was a confession. But he didn't realize this. He didn't realize this at all because the man responded by saying, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. In other words, God is saying, you shall no longer be the liar and the schemer and the trickster. Those days are over. Now I'm giving you a new name. And with this, I'm giving you a new identity. Now the meaning of this name is uncertain. Again, it's a, it's a, a point of debate uh, by scholars. But I will suggest that we should consider all the possible options as valid. It ranges from... God contended, God persisted, God prevailed, God struggled, all the way to he is a prince with God and he is God's governor. In any case, one thing is evident. The focus is shift from Jacob to God. His name is no longer describing Jacob's filthy past. It's describing God's amazing nature. In his first wrestling match, which he, which he uh, didn't win, he still he was awarded a title. Jacob, the heel grabber. In this second wrestling match, which he also didn't win, he was awarded a new title, a new name, Israel. And then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. Jacob didn't realize what was going on. He didn't realize that by saying his name, he confessed. He didn't realize that by being given a new name, he was given a chance at having a new identity and putting this, this past behind him. Because he asks for the man's name. And this is further evidence that he thought that he was wrestling a spirit. An evil spirit. Because as I said, in ancient Middle East, there was a superstition which is still alive in many cultures, including my own. My own that if you know the spirit's name, you can claim that spirit's power. If you know the name of a spirit, you are entitled to that spirit's power. And he knew that this spirit must be powerful because he touched him on the hip and his hip was dislocated. So he knew that this was great power and he wanted it. He wanted this power. He still, at this very point, he is still the same old Jacob. He didn't understand the new identity. He didn't accept it. He didn't, he didn't at all understand what was going on. He was still his old self trying to bully the power out of this spirit, trying to make the situation work for his favor trying to finesse his way out of this situation. So God then asks him and says, why is it that you're asking my name? 
and there he blessed him. God saw right through him. He knew that Jacob, Jacob didn't understand what was going on. He knew that all of these things flew over Jacob's head. So he decided to give him another, yet another reality check. So he asked him, why is it that you are asking for my name? And Jacob, he was silent. He didn't answer. And it's only then that God blessed him. You see, at that point, Jacob finally understood what was going on. He finally understood, it finally dawned on him what it was, who it was that he was wrestling with. It finally dawned on him that by saying his name, he confessed. It finally dawned on him that by being given a new name, he was given a new identity. It finally dawned on him then that the man he was wrestling was God. He even hinted at that. It finally dawned on him that he was still trying to bully God out of a blessing. And he was silent. And it's only then when he accepted all these things that he was worthy of being blessed. Jacob understood then that the reason for the wrestling, the reason for the struggle, was a change of identity. The, re the purpose of the wrestling was transformation. And when he realized this, he received the blessing. When he accepted that he is not the one deciding the terms and the conditions, then he received the blessing. It was God who was deciding the terms and the conditions, and the condition was a change of heart. So the text says that Jacob called the place Peniel or Penuel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. A confirmation that he understood what just happened. Peniel or Peniel literally means face of God. And in the text, the man disappeared as suddenly as he appeared. All we know is that Jacob is left alone, and he's left to, to ponder and wonder on what just happened to him. He was left to look back on his past and look at his future and compare. He was left to compare the identity he had so far with the identity that was just given to him. The heel grabber versus God's governor. Jacob schemes versus God persists. Jacob hustles versus God prevails. Jacob the liar versus God's prince. And the text concludes by saying that the sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. And it's just like in, in a comic book that I liked as a child. All of you who come from ex-Yugoslavia might remember this comic book, Lucky Luke or Talichni Tom. The rest of you have no idea what I'm talking about. It's a Belgian it's a Belgian comic about a cowboy who is um, the fastest, the fastest uh, gunman in, in the West. And he's, in fact, faster than his own shadow. He can pull out the gun and shoot his shadow before the shadow can follow his movements. And um, at the end of every comic book, there is there's one big scene. He is riding away into a big sunset, in this case, in the American prairie. And he has a cigarette in his, in his uh, mouth, but only in the first few editions, because then they realize that children are reading this, so they put a straw. They put a straw in his, in his lips. But those of you who haven't read this comic might be familiar with other archetypal images like this. You might be familiar with um, Rambo or Rocky or uh, any character played by Schwarzenegger or any other more recent example that I am not familiar with, but where the hero is wounded, he is bleeding, he is hurt, but he finished. He defeated everyone, he killed everyone there was to kill, and now he's walking away into the sunrise or the sunset. And I'm telling you, the Bible is better than Hollywood because the Bible paints these pictures, we just need to see them. And Jacob is limping into the sunrise. And he's a new man. His name is Israel. He has a new identity. And his limp 
is a reminder that he had an encounter with God, an encounter that changed him. So if we zoom out from the text and we ask ourselves, what can this mean for us? What, is the, what can we learn from this text and apply to our lives? I will tell you that in, every one, in each and every one of our lives, there is a time when we feel alone, when all our family and friends and possessions and everything we think we have, everything, we, everything that grounds us and holds us together is far away from us. And when we are facing real or perceived danger, when we are afraid, we perceive challenges, and those are the times in injustice, and those are the times when we want to be like, like the prophet Habakkuk or like the, the psalmist in many, in many cases, where we want to wrestle with God. Those are the times when we want to ask God, why? Why is this injustice uh, per persisting? Why are the wicked prospering and why are the just suffering? Those are the times we want to wrestle with God. But I will tell you something else. There are also times in our lives when we are alone, but when all the masks are removed, when all the restrictions are taken away, when all the inhibitions are removed, and those are the times when we are truly who we are, when we are truly our most authentic selves, like Jacob at the Jabbok doing ja Jacob at the Yabek doing Yabek, those are the times when we are our most authentic selves, and those are the times when God wants to wrestle with us. And the text never says who started this match. It never, said, it never says who gave the first blow. But I like to believe that God will not attack you. He says, I stand at the door and I'm knocking. He, he, he doesn't say I'm bringing a, a battle ram to, 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 to break into your house. He says, I'm knocking. And he will stand there. He will stand there in that darkness. He will, he will scare you. But he will stand there, but he will not attack you. He will wait for you to make a move. And if you do make a move, I will tell you one thing. Wrestling with God is not easy. Wrestling with God will hurt you. He will touch you where you don't want to be touched. He will hit you where it hurts the most. He will strike you. He will, he will throw you off balance. He will dislocate your hip if needed. But what's most important is that you don't give up. Not because you're trying to bully a blessing out of him. You see, there, there's, there's a popular um, acronym um, in the English-speaking Christian world. And that is PUSH. Pray until something happens. PUSH. I am not saying that this is necessarily a bad policy. But I would like to examine it a little bit. Pray until something happens. How many times have you caught yourself? I definitely have caught myself many times using this for my benefit. I will pray, I will be on my knees until they're bleeding, but just God help me pass this exam, or just help me get this visa and stay in the country, or just help me uh, have justice in this, in this particular area or in this other area. I caught myself doing that so many times that I think that this is not the most useful policy. Pray until something happens, push. How about pull? How about pray until left limping? How about you pray not until your circumstances change, not until God takes away all the injustices of the world. How about you pray until you are changed? How about you pray until something changes in you? How about you pray until your hip is dislocated? And how about you pray until you accept and still give praise? How about you keep praying until you are changed? pray until left limping. And in this process of wrestling, God will ask you your name. God will confront you with your true identity. He will confront you with your most authentic self, the one hidden, the one that no one else sees or no one else knows about. He will ask you to look at your past and ask yourself, what is my name? What is my identity? Who am I really? You will have to ask yourselves, are, are you the apparent Christian but actually undercover pagan who is sitting here in church pretending to be worshipping God but actually worshipping everything but God? The list can be long, but I'll just mention a few things. You might be worshipping 
money, you might be worshiping your career, you might be worshiping girls, boys, women, men, shopping, clothes, makeup, the gym, your buttocks, your abs, someone else's buttocks, someone else's abs. You might be the person that grew up in the church, spent all of that time in the Sabbath school and in, in church worshiping, taking part in the program, but then you left for uni. And you forgot how to spell Jesus the moment you walked out of your parents' house. You might be the, 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 the holier-than-thou person that sits here in church and thinks that just because you are doing all these wonderful things and taking part in the program and studying theology or something like that, you're better than someone else who isn't and whose sins are maybe visible and yours are not. You might think that you are, you might be the, the, the church politician who's always trying to, like Jacob, you know, you're trying to win favor with everyone. You're trying to, to uh, benefit in every situation. You're trying to be close to the right people so you can make decisions, so you can decide who gets the pulpit and who doesn't, who gets elected for which position and who doesn't. Who are you really? Because whoever you are, God has a new identity for you. Whatever answer you give to the question, what is your name? God has a new one for you. You can never give God a name that's good enough and he will say, okay, fair enough then. Keep on. Keep it up. Whatever name you give, God has a new one for you. So you need to ask yourself, who am I really? And when he gives you this new name, you need to accept it. You need to accept the new identity. Identity as his prince, as his princess, as his governor. And I'll tell you one thing, the ancient Mesopotamians got one thing right. The, the pagans in the ancient Middle East got one thing right. I will tell you that they understood one eternal truth. And that is that knowing the name of the person you're wrestling with does give you his power. Knowing the name of the person you're wrestling with will give you his power. You will be able to claim that power if you know this person's name and this name this, this name of this person is Jesus. And if you know his name and if you have a relationship with him, you can claim his power. There's a song that says, there's something about the name Jesus. It is the sweetest name I know. Another song says, what a wonderful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. Another song says, there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. This man, man called Jesus, he, he came to this earth and he wrestled. He wrestled with, the, with all the sins of this world. He wrestled with all the forces of evil. He wrestled with all the schemes and tricks and snares of the devil. He wrestled with all the sorrows of life and all the misery of death and he prevailed. He wrestled with them all on the hill called Calvary and he had more than just his hip dislocated. He had his arms pierced. He had his feet pierced. He had his ribs pierced. But most importantly, he had his heart broken. Because of your sin and mine. He was put in the grave. He was confirmed dead. He stayed there for three days, but then he got up. He wrestled with death and he won. He wrestled with sin and he prevailed. And he walked away victorious. And now, he wants to wrestle with you. My dear sisters and brothers, my friends, wherever you are in your life, whatever challenges you might be facing, I pray that this place becomes your penuel. I pray that this place becomes the place where you wrestle with God. I want you to, to see him standing there in the night. I want you to engage with him. I want you to wrestle with him. I want you to be hurt because I want you to be transformed. And I want you to walk away from that place knowing that you wrestled with God and men and you prevailed. My prayer is that you come out of this wrestling match with a new identity. That wherever you are in your life right now, you can walk away from it saying, I have seen God face to face. May this time in your life be your penuel.
And as you come out of this night, and as you walk into the sunrise, my prayer is that you may be limping. And that this limp stays with you forever. And that it may be a reminder to you forever that you had an encounter with God, you wrestled with God, and you prevailed. Amen. 